I'd like to explain a little bit about MBDC and who we are. So the Nebraska Business Development Center, if you're not aware, um, is a statewide program. And there's funding that we receive from the SBA as well as other federal and state agencies. And that allows us to provide services to Nebraska-based businesses. Locally, there's a small business development center that's here on Shadron State College uh, campus. And um, we have Jennifer Whitrock with the Small Business Development Center joining us today. And uh, she's a representative. She can visit with you a, a little bit in between workshops about the services that they provide. But primarily, they do a lot with business planning, loan packaging, marketing research, those types of services. Um, and if, it, if they're not able to provide a service internally, they're also able to network and share, um, share referrals with other agencies and organizations that can provide the services that you need. The other types of things that MBDC does are we provide training and development. We have export assistance that we provide for companies that are looking at ex exporting products. Uh, sustainability and pollution prevention. Commercialization assistance, and I was uh, mentioning earlier uh, as I was visiting with Pat, that's really our SBIR, STTR program. Um, federal uh, agencies provide research and development funding for companies that are developing new technologies. Um, exit and succession planning for those businesses that are preparing for that stage and then also government contracting assistance. And that's really the, the arm of MBDC that I represent. So what does a PTAC program do? We do a number of things. I would say that 80% of the services or requests that I receive are for assistance with the SAM registration, the System for Award Management. And that allows companies to contract with federal agencies. Um, we can help out with a DUNS number profile. We can help out with the SAM registration, state of Nebraska registrations. I can provide information for FEMA, so on and so forth. So we can really help companies complete their registration processes. We can also help them determine appropriate NACS codes. Uh, those are North American industry classification codes, uh, federal supply codes, product service codes. NIGP codes if you're selling to, to an organization like the state of Nebraska, um, so on and so forth. We help companies to de develop the appropriate marketing strategies. So uh, one company may market to federal agencies or state agencies in a different manner than another agency would or another company would. So it really kind of depends on your products, your industry, how you might um, market to, to government agencies. We can help identify uh, opportunities with the government. We provide services such as bid match, and that's a free service that we provide to our clients. Um, essentially, we set up a profile and bid match monitors government websites for solicitations that match your profile, and then they'll send you an email with a notification letting you know that there is an opportunity available. We can also help companies understand guidelines and provide access to resources that help companies uh, complete a successful bid. A um, couple of the workshops that I'm offering today are going to be helping uh, companies understand those guidelines. We'll talk about hub zones um, in the next workshop and then the Davis-Bacon Act in the workshop right after that. So the PTAC program, as I mentioned, is a statewide program just like MBDC. Um, we have five PTAC consultants throughout the state, and um, the, the area that I cover is a 48-county area, primarily central and western Nebraska. So it's about 50,000 square miles. I have about 600 clients within that territory, um, and so it uh, keeps me on the road, keeps me busy. So, um, But we are able to help any Nebraska-based businesses throughout the state. So that kind of brings me to today's workshop, the first workshop, um, Government Market. And the tagline for this one is moving from yellow pages to blue pages. So a lot of companies do really well in business to business sales, but they get really nervous about how do I enter the government market? Where do I start? What do I do? And it kind of depends, again, on the products and services that you sell, but also which agencies you might be interested in selling to. 
So that's really kind of the focus of today's workshop is helping you identify the basics of government contracting. So one of the first things that I kind of like to start out with is do you sell to the government as a company, potentially? If so, if not, obviously you're interested if you don't already, and you may sell to some agencies, but you're not really sure how to start selling to other agencies. So um, what I'd like you to do right now is just take a few minutes here, make a list of all of the government agencies that you can think of. Looks like pretty good lists. Um, Tina, you sat up front, so if you don't mind me calling upon you, would would you mind sharing uh, the list of government agencies that you that you wrote down? Um, ASCS for service, BLM, power stations or dams, cities, counties, parks, and rec areas, and NRD. Okay. Okay. So really, a, a pretty good selection. So you've got the Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management parks um, and, and uh, uh, the dams and power generation, okay. Any, any additional ones that you might think of? S Sarah, did you have anything additionally? The post, the post office, okay. Yeah, Chatter, Chatter, or Chatteron State College. Yeah, it would be, um, it would be, I would consider it government, yep. Public schools. Public schools, yep. Okay. Anything else? County government? Yep, yeah, and, yep. She, she did say city and county, yep. I know I left something off, but county government is, is a different one, yep. Um, all your law enforcement agencies would be government. Yep, law enforcement agencies, so police department, sheriff's office. Yep. National Guard. That's Department of Defense. Yeah. 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 Okay. Do you have anything else, Trudy? That in addition, or also like kind of national parks. There's state parks. There's other kinds of parks. Yep. National and state both. Yep. Yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Yep, Federal Aviation Administration, so FAA. Um, yep, absolutely. And, and as Trudy mentioned, that so the Job Corps Center is, is funded by the Forest Service 
as well as um, Department of Labor. So kind of a nice uh, combination there. So, so there are a lot of agencies around, um, and actually that was a pretty good list. It, it was fairly widespread. Yeah, Jennifer. The VA is also government. Yes. Yep. Which also gets into medical. I'm sorry. It gets into a medical field, which we don't normally think about. Exactly. Yep. The medical side of things. And, and actually, when you think about it, a campus is almost like a mini community. So if, if, if a community were to buy something or need a service or a product, a campus probably needs almost that similar. And the same thing for the Job Corps Center, I would imagine. So, um, yeah, yeah, everything from, yeah, supplies and services. So, um, so it's kind of, when you think about government opportunities, sometimes it's, it's easy to have blinders on and think, okay, there's, there's a few agencies that I know of, but that's the nice thing about the workshop is sharing some ideas, all of a sudden it starts to generate some additional thoughts about there's more government agencies around than maybe we realize sometimes. And so it does touch um, several different a aspects of our lives. And so there are a lot of opportunities out there in the government market. Kind of comes down to what specific market or what agencies do you want to, to target? Are you looking at local? Are you considering county, state, federal? Because there may be different registrations, um, different processes, and it's important to really get to understand those and get to know those. So if you're interested in local or county opportunities, really it's very similar in most cases that I've come across to business to business sales. It's, it's probably really important to get out and get to know that, uh, that client, that agency, and the individuals within that agency. Start to ask them, are there registrations? How do I become a vendor? Um, it's, it's really about a lot of face-to-face -face time, building those relationships. So what we usually recommend is drawing a 50-mile radius around your location, um, depending on, again, your products and or services. Construction companies, a lot of the times, if it's a local construction company, a 50 or 100-mile radius is a pretty good radius for them to work within. But I have some clients that will never, ever sell their products within a 100-mile radius of where they're making it. They actually have to go further out um, on a federal or a, uh, sometimes an international level to be able to sell their products. So you really want to kind of adjust your focus when you're doing this and, and get in that mindset of government sales versus just business to business. It does operate a little bit differently. There may be registrations and, and other requirements, uh, regulations that you'll have to follow as well. So marketing to local county or state agencies, again, it's very similar to business to business. What kind of tools do you have to be able to market to them? How can you share your products, your services? Do you advertise? Do you have a website? Are you in communications with these uh, agencies? What's that? Facebook. A lot of companies do Facebook now. Yeah, exactly. Um, they may not have a website for their company, but they have a Facebook page for their company. Um, that's helpful. Government agencies, and it kind of depends on what level. Um, I would say most federal agencies probably prefer a website that's established for that company. Um, a lot of the times also that goes along with that website being established is maybe what is your, how is your email set up? Is it a Yahoo account? Is it a, uh, uh, or is it an actual uh, account for your company? So. Um, do you, do you run into that? I mean, is there anything? It's a, probably a little bit different for you, Trudy, but do you ever do market research out on websites and you wish that companies had better developed websites or anything like that? Yeah, I shop on the internet and I do purchasing, so yeah. I'm on the internet all the time. Yeah. And some websites are, you know, easier. Basically, if they don't have a phone number that I can call them, just yep. in case there's any problems, I probably won't use that website. Yep. Phone numbers, addresses are good to see. Um, um, and if I actually email yep. them and not have any contact back, yeah. I won't use that website. 
Yeah. So it is really important to, to maintain a website, to have a website potentially and maintain that website. I do have some clients that don't have a website, um, but they have a very focused marketing effort for the agencies that they want to sell to. So it kind of depends. Again, it's something that we could discuss individually because it's not going to be the same for every company. So, um, but get to know the client or the agency. Build relationships. Even if you don't think that that agency will probably buy your product, um, uh, they may not be a client of yours, but they may be able to refer you to somebody else within their organization that does buy your product or service. So it's important to make that good connection with them. Um, definitely complete any applicable registrations that are required. So. If you're interested in the federal market, kind of as we were just discussing, we, we listed a lot of different agencies, um, some federal, some state and local. But um, if you had to hazard a guess about how many federal agencies there are, what would you guess? Like individual designations of federal agents, yeah, all over the, the country. Yeah, well, um, if you look ahead, the Louisiana State University actually did research into this, and they identified over 1,300 distinct organizations against all three branches of the government, 1,300. So again, when we talk about focusing um, and developing a marketing strategy, it's important because with 1,300 different agencies just at the federal level, um, it's really easy to become overwhelmed and, and not really know what direction to turn. So, um, again, developing that strategy is really important early on. So, what is the federal market? In 2015, $90.7 billion was spent by the federal government um, through contracts. <clears throat> the small business goal is 23%. So I'll kind of explain what these set-asides are. The federal agencies um, have goals to set aside a certain percentage of eligible contracts to small businesses or these other set-aside categories. And they work really hard to meet those goals. <clears throat> um, the small business goal is 23%. The federal government met that last year. The Small Disadvantaged Business Goal, that's the 8A program, it's a Small Business Administration program. Their goal is 5%. Again, they met that 5% goal. Woman-owned small business, 5%. They met that 5% goal. Veteran Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Goal is 3% set aside. Again, the federal government met that 3% set aside goal last year. Hubs-owned small business, the federal agencies did not meet that goal. And that's one of the reasons why the next workshop today. That goal is 3%. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're considering the dollars that are on the table, they actually um, achieved 1.87% last year, the federal agencies did. So how much money was designated or should have been designated as a set aside for hub zone that didn't get spent? It's actually over a billion dollars. So um, when you're talking about the dollars that we're talking about with federal spend, that's, that's really a category that's very important. Every federal agency that I've talked to is seeking out hub zone businesses. Um, the nice thing is, Dawes County and Sheridan County right now are designated hub zone counties. So it would be fairly simple for a company within one of those two counties. It doesn't mean that it's a done deal, but it would be uh, much easier to meet that requirement for a hub zone business within one of those two counties. So I mentioned the, the uh, small disadvantaged business. Again, that's an 8A program. So I'm gonna give a quick overview of some of these uh, programs, and then if you wanted to discuss in more detail, we sure can. Um, the 8A program is a nine-year program, and it's very different from the other set-asides. Um, you graduate out of the 8A program, 
There are certain exceptions to that, but for the most part, a company has one opportunity to be in the 8A program. Once you complete those nine years, you're not able to re-enter the 8A program. Um, the first four years is the de developmental stage. So that's where the SBA is really trying to help you gain traction as a new business, as a small disadvantaged business. Five through nine, those, the years five through nine is a transitional stage. So really what that focuses on is helping you move out of that developmental, out of that infancy, so to speak, into um, a more developed uh, business. There's the opportunity to earn sole source contracts. That's probably one of the greatest benefits of the 8A program. A lot of companies that are interested in the 8A program and, and um, apply for the 8A program are interest, most interested in sole source contracts. Um, so that means that a federal contracting officer, if they believe that you are selling product at a market price, so you're not taking advantage of the government, um, that they could sole source a contract with you. Um, they also, through the 8A program, provide training, management, and technical assistance and mentoring. You also have access to federal supplies, surplus uh, property program. So, um, so there are definitely some benefits of the 8A program. In Nebraska, in 2015, there were only 14 firms that were certified 8A. Okay, so not a lot of companies. It is a challenging program to get into, um, but 11 of those 14 companies did receive 8A contracts, and it totaled more than $245 million just this past year. Woman-owned small business program and economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business program. Um, a lot of the times, folks will think, oh, we're a woman-owned business, 100% woman-owned, <clears throat> we qualify. You might, but you might not. Again, it's a very complex program. This is the only program that is determined by those NACS codes. Um, if your company does not have the correct NACS codes, if you're not in the right industry, even if you are a woman-owned small business, you won't be able to certify as a woman-owned small business. There's other requirements to that as well. Um, it does allow for self-certification right now. Um, the SBA is still allowing self-certification. However, Congress in 2014 through the National Defense Authorization Act eliminated self-certification for the Women on Small Business Program. <clears throat> so even though Congress eliminated it, the SBA is still allowing it. It is, um, HUBZone program is underutilized. Woman-owned small business program is the, probably the next underutilized program um, because it's very labor intensive. Um, I could explain more in detail, but that would probably take up much of our time. There are a lot of changes to the woman-owned small business program going on right now. So in Nebraska, <clears throat> last year there were 309 firms, um, $238 million in contracting for those firms last year. Service Disabled Veteran Owned Small Business Program. Um, again, this, this program allows for self-certification. The, the Veterans, Department of Veterans Affairs does operate a CVE verification process. It's not a certification, it's only verification. Um, so you could choose to do that. Really, the only agency that it pertains to right now is the VA. So if you're looking, if you're a service disabled veteran or a veteran owned small business, and you're looking to contract with the VA, you probably want to pers pursue the CVE verification. If not, you can self certify, and that's, um, that's effective with any of the agencies. But you have to prove that you meet the requirements of the veteran owned or service disabled veteran owned small business programs. Um, in Nebraska in 2015, there were 234 of those companies, and 118 million was contracted with those companies. Hub zones, I was just mentioning. Um, 
the, again, this is a, a program that would be very preferential at this point. A lot of federal agencies are asking for hub zone businesses. Um, you can qualify for set-asides or sole source contracts as well. So there is sole source opportunities within the hub zone uh, businesses. You do have to be certified through the SBA. And there's three different methods for contracting with hub zone businesses. We'll go into a lot more detail <clears throat> in the next presentation about those. Um, but it does provide a 10% price preference evaluation um, if you're bidding on an open and full competition contract. So <clears throat> in Nebraska, there were only 29 hub zone firms last year. Um, 31.4 million in, in prime contracts went to those companies. These are the counties that are designated hub zone right now as of today's date. <clears throat> as you can see, again, Dawes County is designated. It's been redesignated until January 2018. At this point, it would probably lose its designation in January of 2018, unless circumstances change. This program is constantly in flux. It's, it's based on income and it's based on unemployment. So it doesn't take a whole lot sometimes to tip the scale. There was actually a county out in eastern Nebraska that lost its designation and regained it within a six month period. So it, it does happen. Um, it can tip back and forth. Sheridan County is designated until January of 2017. <clears throat> Box Butte lost their designation just this last year. With uh, federal contracting, as I mentioned, there are regulations you do want to be aware of. Um, FAR Parts 13 through 17 talk about contracting methods and contracting types. <clears throat> there are different ways that the federal government may purchase from companies. And so you do want to be aware of those. Um, FAR Part 19 is the small business programs. Again, that would deal with the 8A, the hub zone, woman-owned small business, service disabled veteran. Um, FAR Parts 30 and 31 are cost principles. And then Part 33 deals with protests, disputes, and appeals. It's really important to understand all of the federal acquisition regulations that may apply to your business. Um, but these are some key areas where uh, the SBA highlights that you, you really need to know about these areas. <clears throat> Understanding contracting levels. <clears throat> um, as I was just mentioning, the federal government purchases a number of ways. And one of those ways is with a government purchase card. If, and it kind of depends on if you're selling products or services, typically in the $3,000 to $3,500 range, um, if it's under that amount, they, the federal agencies can purchase with a purchase card. It means a lot less paperwork, um, I believe, right, Trudy, or is typically, or reasonably less, okay. Um, enough less paperwork, or it's much easier anyway, that approximately 70% of all federal transactions are completed with government purchase cards, so about 70%. Again, these are not the high dollar purchases. So it takes a lot of $500 and $2,000 purchases to make up for a $60 million purchase. But the volume is really with the purchase card. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, um, mention the Postal Service. The Postal Service is the only federal agency that does not follow federal acquisition regulations. Their purchase card limit is $10,000. So if you're doing business with the Postal Service, they can purchase up to $10,000 on a purchase card. Um, so it's a little bit different than the other federal agencies. It's kind of, kind of unique. Um, if a solicitation is below $10,000, that agency really doesn't have to publicize it. I would guess in most cases, they'll probably call up local contractors, you know, if it's a, if it's a service or uh, local stores if it's products. Just get some pricing, and then they make a decision based off of that. So they'll probably seek out some bids or some pricing and make a purchase without publicizing it. Anything 10 to $25,000 has to be publicized in a public forum. That public forum can vary. 
It could be websites. It could be, um, it could be a physical posting within their office. So it really kind of depends. That's why it becomes very important, whatever agency that you're looking to sell product to, you kind of find out how they post those solicitations. How do they come up with a vendor's list? <clears throat> anything above 25,000, and there, when I say anything above, I mean there are some, uh, some items that aren't posted on FedBizOps, but for the most part, anything above $25,000 on a federal purchase is posted on FedBizOps. That is the federal government's repository, for lack of a better term, for any federal uh, purchases above $25,000. <clears throat> um, simplified acquisition threshold. So if you're looking at contracts, anything below $150,000 is considered simplified acquisition. Um, it's a streamlined process, and it typically requires three quotes. Um, it's going to be a less complex purchase than something that's above that simplified acquisition threshold um, or over $150,000. <clears> Those proposals requ require or must allow a 30-day response time in most cases. Again, sometimes there's exceptions to that rule as well. The important thing for small business is there's automatic set-asides for any purchases below $150,000. So between that purchase card purchase price of $3,000 to $3,500 up to $150,000 should be designated as a set-aside for small business. Now again, sometimes there's exceptions to that. <clears throat> um, but for the most part, that is true, um, and, and most agencies hold to that. If it's above $150,000, small businesses can still win those contracts, but the purchasing agent or the contracting officer has to be aware of at least two businesses, two small businesses that are going to bid on that opportunity. Um, if not, then it's typically opened up to full and open competition. So. Small businesses, or what the government terms other than small businesses, any anyone could bid on those. So, yeah. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Anyone could bid on those. Uh, and and I mentioned small business, and then other than small business. So, what would be considered other than small business? SBA, government agencies are other than small, absolutely, and they can't earn government contracts. Yep. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm asking, depending on who your criteria is, the SBA. Oh, okay. Uh, the SBA's criteria for what small business is, is not necessarily what they're yeah. with. Yep. Like yep, SBA or small businesses, and, and that designation of small can be quite large. Um, so you may have some companies that have 1,200 employees and they're still considered small um, by the SBA. Yeah, they're designated by the SBA through the NAX code? Yep. Yep, through the NAX code and it's either by revenue or by number of employees. Yep. So it's usually in the millions of dollars if it's designated revenue and, and in the hundreds of employees, typically, if it's designated by the number of employees. But other than small would be government agencies, it'll be nonprofits, and it'll be large companies. So the, the federal government kind of lumps those three together. So small businesses are truly small businesses. They can't be nonprofits, they can't be a government agency, it has to be a small business. Um, otherwise, it's considered other than small. So how do you find opportunities? Well, there's kind of three different methods or three different types of um, information that I'll kind of mention here. One is to take a look back. And there, there's really two different tools that you can use to take a look backwards at what the government has spent already. <clears throat> One is usaspending.gov. The other one is FPDSNG, 
uh, FPDS, new gen uh, FPDS new generation. Um, <clears throat> they both report very similar types of information. I typically use USA Spending. I do also use FPDS NG as well. Um, but I'd say this is probably the one that's a little bit easier to use, especially if you're going out there for the first time to try to research information. What the agencies are currently spending is typically found on FBO, uh, FedBizOps, or other websites um, as well, electronically. And then what agencies are planning to purchase in the future are included on agency forecasts. Now, sometimes it's going to be hard for a company to tell if there's anything, any planned spending based on that agency forecast for their particular product or service. Um, but it can kind of help you see some trends and figure out. Um, a lot of the times they'll list larger construction projects in agency forecast. Anything that's going to be a significant spend, they want to make sure that they include in that agency forecast. What kind of parameter, do you have parameters? Do you feed into the agency forecast, Trudy, with the Job Corps Center, or do you, do, you, do you feed any information into the agency forecast from the Job Corps Center side of things? <coughs> Yeah. 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 So it'll that's the that's kind of the backward looking about what the government's already spent. Um, and and what I found is agency forecasts. Some agencies, it, it kind of depends on the agency how that information is fed in. Um, again, a lot of the times it seems like it's very large projects that are being planned that will feed into that agency forecast. Um, if it's not really large spending, then it, they just kind of generalize what that spending would be. So this is a screenshot of USA Spending. Um, provides a lot of good information. Again, this is why I like using USA Spending. So it'll tell, based on Nebraska statistics, how much was awarded fiscal year 2015, the number of contracts. It'll tell you who the main prime contractors were that earned those contracts, as well as subcontractors. So it's really kind of a helpful tool in finding out if those contracts are being awarded. Let's say you're an, an electrician and you're wanting to work on some construction projects. Um, you can go out and find out who are the large contractors getting these federal contracts in Nebraska. Now you know who to talk to, who to market to. <clears throat> FedBizOps, so this is um, showing a screenshot of a solicitation. Again, really good information on here. It will give you a summary of uh, that solicitation. It also provides um, the release date and the date that it's due. Um, if it's set aside for any one of the set asides, it'll tell you the NACS code that's set aside for this contract. At the bottom of the page, it has some of the most important information on there. It has the contact information for the contracting officer. So you know who to ask questions of. Um, so if you have questions about that solicitation, it's a really good idea to, to have some communication with that contracting officer. <clears throat> Bid match, I mentioned. We can set up a profile, and it will email you notifications. So marketing to government agencies. Um, I mentioned SAM, the System for Award Management. If you're not registered in SAM, federal agencies are not going to be able to purchase from you unless it's with a purchase card, okay? Um, so if it's a contracting action, um, anything above that $3,000 or $3,500 level, typically you're going to need to be registered in SAM. So that's the first place to start. Um, if you're selling to government agencies at the state level, then state registrations, some agencies within the federal government or state will also have separate registrations. FEMA is a good example. 
um, they have a separate registration process. It's pretty simple. It's a one-page application process, and you become a vendor to them. Um, but it's, it's important to be aware of those different registration processes. Um, complete an SBA profile, Small Business Administration profile within the Dynamic Small Business Search. Essentially, what, what the Dynamic Small Business Search is, is it's a repository of all of the companies, all of the small businesses registered in SAM who have created a profile. And it's kind of like a catalog. It's like an Office Max catalog or a Sears and Robux catalog. Um, federal agencies will be able to go in and look up by NAX code or by keywords which companies sell the products and services that they're looking to buy. So it's really important to gain the visibility with the federal agencies. The nice thing about that dynamic small business search is that it is not alphabetical. So the SBA has it so, set up so that um, when somebody does a search, it will do a random order of returning the results. So if you look up for 236220, which is a construction acts code today, um, right now, if you looked it up, it would have businesses listed in whatever order. And then if you went back in and you searched five minutes later, it'll have those businesses listed in a different order. Um, the SBA did that on purpose because they know that if people start alphabetically, the A's and the B's are going to get the business. The Y's and the Z's and the W's are not going to get a whole lot of calls, not going to get a lot of opportunities. So they rotate that. Um, so it hopefully will provide the best opportunity for, for all companies. Yeah, Tina? Is there a way to look at that catalog, or can you describe, is it very regulated, like you have seven words and one link, or you can have 150 words, two links, yeah. or it, I suppose it's pretty it's a, it's, a, it's electronic. It's actually a public search. Yeah. <clears throat> so anybody could go on that. Yep, so um, what I'll do is I'll get... Oh, your, in, your entry? Yeah, usually what I do with companies is I will print off, if, if I'm working with a client, I'll print off some similar, some companies that have similar um, SBA profiles, and I'll say, these are what competitors have listed, these are things to consider, and, and then we just kind of talk about through all, um, throughout that profile what it is that they may or may not want to include in their profile. So, yep. Keywords, capabilities, yep. It is a public search, yep. Anybody, anybody can go out and look at it, you bet. It's a very, very useful tool. Um, not only do government agencies use that, but prime contractors also use that. So, um, prime contractors, if, if a company has a prime contract over $700,000, they have to have a subcontracting plan. So those same set-aside goals that we were talking about earlier for the federal agencies, those roll down to prime contractors. So if you have a prime contract over 700,000, you have to have a plan to meet the goal for 23% of your contract to be set aside for small business, 5% for uh, small disadvantage, 5% for woman-owned, 3% for service disabled veteran, and 3% for hub zone. So those prime contractors are also out there using the dynamic small business search to try to find companies to contract with. Yep. Capability statements are helpful. Basically, that's a one to two page resume for your company to show a contracting officer what products or services you offer, what your differentiators are, what differentiates you from the competition, um, you'll put on there your codes, um, your cage code, your NAX codes, your DUNS number, um, whether or not you accept credit cards, anything that would be helpful in helping that contracting officer choose to do business with you. Um, and then there's opportunities to either mail those out, email those out, you might hand deliver those. Kind of, again, it depends on the agencies that you're trying to sell to. Contact small business specialists, small business liaison officers, and then attending industry days, um, procurement conferences, so on and so forth. Um, MBDC, 
Last year, um, we had a procurement conference in Omaha. It was on November 4th, I believe. Um, and what we're offering that same procurement conference again this year. And what we do is we bring in contracting officers for different agencies. Um, and then there's also prime contractors there. So it's a good opportunity to learn some topics about government contracting and also to network with people who may be buying the products and services that you're interested in. <clears throat> government registrations, again, federal. Um, I have SAM listed there, FedBizOps, FedBid.com, um, state of Nebraska purchasing. Other states, if you're interested in other state purchasing, I did put on the NASPO website. It's the National Association of State Procurement Officers. They have a map. So let's say if, if you're looking at a solicitation for Montana, um, you can click on Montana on that map. It'll take you straight out to that state's purchasing website so you can find out what requirements you would need to meet in order to bid on that contract. Um, also local, again, find out if the town or county requires registrations. Some do, some don't. Um, these are the types of solicitations. I'm not going to go into a lot of details. Um, you do have a slide in the handouts. Invitation for bids. Um, probably the, the most simple of, of uh, solicitations. Request for proposals, a little bit more advanced. And then RFQs, request for quotes, are typically pretty, uh, pretty advanced or complex purchases. Or actually, I have that backwards. Request for quotes is less complex. The request for proposals is more complex. <clears throat> um, Subcontracting opportunities. I kind of mentioned the subcontracting, so anything over 700,000. So it's good to identify prime contractors as well. Um, you can find opportunities on FedBizOps to potentially line up with a, with a prime contractor. Or the Small Business Administration has what they call subnet. And they list uh, subcontracting opportunities out on that website as well. There are limitations on subcontracting. These are actually in process of changing a little bit right now. But in general, um, whoever is winning that contract needs to provide at least 50% of the work that goes into that contract. Um, and when I say work, I mean value. So um, you can buy a product and then enhance it. You might do something to that product to enhance the value of it um, and thereby increase the value of it by 50%. I know some companies will buy certain products and they'll put them together. You know, they'll kind of take kits, for, for instance. It's not really buying a kit, but they'll buy different components and through their process of, of assembling those components, it adds up to the 50% or more. So. Um, there are some exceptions, obviously, on the construction side of things with general contractors and special trades. Taking care of business is important. Once you win that contract, it's really, really important, obviously, to perform and to perform well. Um, make sure that you understand all of the requirements of the contract and that you meet those requirements. If you can't meet those requirements, communicate. Let the contracting officer or purchasing agent know and develop a strategy to work with them. Um, your past performance will affect your future opportunities to get additional contracts. The federal agencies have two different databases, PEEPERS and SEEPERS. And um, as a contractor, you gain access to those. So you can see what your past performance is. It's really important that you kind of monitor that and if there are some issues, that you discuss those with the agency. Um, you don't want to just ignore it. It's not going to go away, and it will affect future opportunities. Sometimes there's mistakes made. Um, sometimes wrong information may get put in. So you do want to monitor that. And if it's not accurate, the agencies want to correct that as well. So, OK. Um, so that was kind of quick, a quick overview. Overview, thoughts, questions that you might have? Are there photos in that catalog? 
There are not. Okay. Nope. It's it's all it's electronic and it's all text based. <clears throat> Um, but it will provide, what it does for those contracting officers is it provides um, the details about the business, contact information, so phone numbers, email addresses, um, the NAX codes, any set-asides, if they have a website it could be listed in there, keywords. Um, the capability statement is probably one of the most critical pieces because <clears throat> some companies will do a very basic SBA profile um, so you'll see the name of the company, and I believe the contact, and then the blank space. So it doesn't really tell you what the company does. That, that's the area for the capability statement. So for companies that don't fill that out, they're probably not going to get a lot of calls. If you fill it out well, um, it probably improves your opportunities to get a call from a federal contracting officer. Yeah, that's a great question. There is an opportunity. Great question. The SBA profile does have a references section, um, and and you that is a great section to fill out. A lot of companies don't. When you do fill it out, you want to make sure that you update it periodically. Um, so I'll use this as an example. Um, it has the contact name of the agency or company. It doesn't have to be a government agency reference that you list. But it'll have the contact name, the phone number, it'll have the contract number, the, the start date, the end date. Um, I'm trying to remember, there's I think one more piece of information. But I have a client that I work with. Um, they used to do a lot of government contracting, a lot. Um, started out really kind of back in the 70s and 80s. <clears throat> and they had a pretty nice SBA profile. Um, but their, their government contracting had started to decline more and more and more every year. And they were not sure exactly why. So we talked about past performance, you know, have you been performing? Have you monitored your past performance information? Um, and I looked at their SBA profile one day. All of the contracts that they had listed for, the, for references or past performance on their SBA profile were from the early 90s. So it looked like they hadn't done business in 25 years um, in a government contracting officer's eyes. You know, I mean, if, if they're trying, and again, they're very busy folks. I mean, they have a lot on their plate. So if they're trying to go through and identify which companies to contact, and it looks like that profile hasn't been updated in 25 years, they probably go on to the next one. Because um, there is a lot for them to do. Yeah. So that's a great question. Yep. Yeah. Make sure you update that. Any other questions? Okay. Well, if not, again, thank you so much for uh, coming out to attend this, this workshop.